Good day, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar session that focuses on the intervention for dengue epidemiology, or in short, the IDEM project in Malaysia. 2019 was deemed as one of Asia's hardest hitting year for dengue fever in a long while, and the cases in 2020 have not subsided either in many parts of Asia. As the world battles the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, it is important that we do not lose sight on the battle against dengue. And this is exactly why a project like IDEM is even more relevant during this pandemic, as it aims to reduce the threat of dengue to public health. The project focuses on reassessing a traditionally reactive approach to treating dengue and other vector-borne diseases, while at the same time demonstrating the effectiveness of ongoing management programs that are grounded in prevention. Before we begin, just a bit of housekeeping announcement. The webinar is scheduled for one hour. There will be a series of short presentations followed by a 20 minutes Q&A session. For participants, your audio and video are disabled, but if you have any questions, please type your questions in the Q&A chat box to the left of your screen, to the right of your screen, sorry, and address them to the speaker whom you wish to ask the question to. We will respond to those questions during the Q&A session. There will also be a survey available to you before you leave the webinar and the recording of the webinar will be shared with all registered participants. Today, we are extremely honored to have three distinguished guests with us today. Dr. Rose Nanimuddin, the Head of Vector-Borne Disease Sector from the Ministry of Health of Malaysia. Dr. Nuru Husna Hamid, Research Officer at the Institute for Medical Research and the Principal Investigator of the IDEM project. And Dr. Mitra Saada Shon Ilahi, an epidemiologist based in Lyon, France, and IDEM's project leader. Without further ado, let's bring on Dr. Rose to give us her presentation on the dengue situation in the region and in Malaysia, as well as the dengue surveillance system in Malaysia. Hi, Dr. Rose, take it away. The floor is yours. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you to the organizer for giving me the opportunity to share the dengue situations and the digital dengue surveillance in Malaysia. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, the outline of my presentation. Next. From the WHO reports in 2019, majority of the countries and regions experiencing increase of dengue cases in their countries, and this includes Malaysia. Next. However, till June 2020 uh, and during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, many countries in the region reporting decreased number of dengue cases, except for Singapore. Next. The trend of dengue cases and deaths in Malaysia continue to increase over the year, reflecting the same trend that reported to WHO. So the dengue increase is a global phenomenon. Next slide, please. The dengue incidence rates in Malaysia also continue to increase up to 390 cases per 100,000 populations um, in 2019. However, the case fatality rates reduced to 0.14% last year. Next slide. In 2020, the trend of weekly dengue cases has similar trend to the previous year. Next. This year, Malaysia uh, reporting lower by 13% of the dengue cases and 1% of the dengue deaths uh, in, in, compared to 2019 uh, cases. Next slide, please. The digital dengue surveillance system under the Ministry of Health consists of four systems, which are the DE notifications, e-dengue v version 2, SPWD, and i-dengue for the community. Next slide. All the system is integrated in the term of flow of information. Uh, doctors from private or pl uh, public cl clinics and hospital will notify the sus suspected or confirmed cases 
through the e-notification system. Other source of case notification input from public clinic is through the uh, teleprimary care system or TPC, uh, which is integrated in the e-notification system. After the cases in the e-notifications are uh, checked and verified by the staff in the district health office, uh, the cases will be registered and all the information will be automatically transferred to e-dengue system. Once the case appears in e-dengue system, it will once again verified by the medical officer and registered to the, uh, for investigation and implementation of control activity. All registration, uh, after registration, all information will be transferred to SPWD and iDengue and the information will be shared to public. All this process happen between 24 hours to 48 hours after the case notification. Next slide, please. So this is the e-notifications looks like. Next. There are also other surveillance systems under Ministry of Health and some of the data are included in the digital system. Next slide, please. The e-Dengue was developed in 2009 and upgraded to e-Dengue version 2. It is a real-time web-based surveillance system uh, where the data input is at the district level and accessible at state and national level. It is a smart system which gives you alerts of outbreak and also uh, automated calculation of the effectiveness of the control activity. Also able to produce reports and accessible uh, everywhere. Next slide, please. It is a user-centric information related to certain user only. Uh, it has enhanced business rule and provide active monitoring and alerts uh, to the user. Next slide. Ministry of Health um, and Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation collaborated and developed SPWD or Dengue Outbreak Management System and iDengue Systems. Next slide. The SPWD system is used by the health and municipal staff. Next slide. This is the conventional methods used before SPWD. Next. SPWD system provides real-time supervision through monitoring of cases and outbreaks distribution daily. Next, please. It's also improve efficacy of control activity by accurately in identifying borders through high resolution satellites. Next slide. It's also help the um, uh, help or assist us in in the effective planning of resources such as manpower and equipment. Next slide. This system also helps the program manager in planning of prevention activity. Next. And it's also identify control border accurately. Next slide. And also identifying exact outbreak area involved. Next slide, please. It can also uh, identify the land use uh, in the in a particular area, such as in the hotspot area or in the outbreak area. Next slide. And it has a capability and uh, assist us in uh, in the estimation of population density. Next slide. Um, it is used in the outbreak control uh, activity planning. Next. 
We have another system called the iDengi system. iDengi system is a system which provides platform for information sharing with community. And you can access this uh, website. Uh, it is as in the screen, idengi.agencyremotesensing.gov.my. Next slide, please. Uh, this system is used by public, uh, by other ministries, municipals, reporters from media, universities, and other agencies. Information posted in, in the iDengi are daily dengue cases updates, weekly outbreak and hotspot area updates, edits indexes, and other information. Next slide. Uh, the benefits of digital surveillance systems are it produces timely information, the accessibility is at all levels and everywhere, it is an effective tool for planning and decision making, and it reduces um, underreporting and also customizable, and, uh, and integrations of system is possible with a digital surveillance and provide platform for public interactions and information sharing with other agency and community. My last slide. It is also feasible to everyone and this is a smart system that can be shared with others. Thank you for your attention and your time. Thank you, Dr. Rose, for the very elaborate yet concise overview of the surveillance system in Malaysia. Next, we have Dr. Mitra, who would give us an overview of the project so far. Take it away, Dr. Mitra. Hello, thank you, Sipio, and uh, good day to everyone. And uh, yes, I am going to give you an overview of our ongoing project, which is the intervention for dengue epidemiology in Malaysia. But just before, I would like to give you some really few points about dengue in general. Next, please. So as you know, dengue is a global threat and fast growing disease that showed over 30 fold increase during the last 50 years. And the major determinant of this vast expansion are urbanization, poor sanitation, travel, and of course, climate change. And we all know that in the absence of effective uh, vaccine, vector control is the key solution in dengue prevention and control. Next, please. As reported by the World Health Organization, the majority of vector-borne disease can be prevented by appropriate vector control programs that are guided by local condition. Next, please. So having said that, the rationale for setting up of the item project was based on the following points. We all know that vector control has shown to be highly effective in reducing uh, the density of the Aedes population. However, the proof of its efficacy to reduce the incidence of Aedes borne disease is limited. We just saw that locally adapted and sustainable vector control programs that combine insecticides with different mode action in the same program is recommended. Of course, to be able to assess the efficacy of such program, there is a need for a number, a huge number of uh, dengue cases that are well documented. As just shown by Dr. Rose, Malaysia is a hot spot for dengue and also has a state-of-art reporting system, which is called the e-dengue system, that collects all information about dengue cases. So these are the main reasons why uh, Malaysia is a really suitable place to conduct this trial. Next, please. 
IBEM is a public-private partnership governed by a technical committee composed of epidemiologists, biostatisticians, and entomologists. Dr. Rusna and myself are uh, doing the overall management uh, of the project team that is uh, in charge of implementation of the trial data collection and data entry. Next, please. The main objective of this cluster randomized control trial is to quantify the effectiveness of our proactive integrated vector control management on the incidence of dengue. The secondary objective consists of evaluating the effectiveness of this approach on the density of mosquitoes on, and on insecticide resistance. Next, please. Our intervention program include three major components. The first one is targeted outdoor residual spraying using couch in polyzone. The product is applied to all covered or partly covered walls in all floors once every four months. The second um, component is the deployment of auto dissemination devices that are user friendly control device targeting hard to find dissemination devices. The last, but of course not the least one, is active community engagement. Dr. Hus now will give you uh, much more detail about each of these components later on. Next, please. So our uh, uh, trial uh, include uh, in, in total 300 locali localities or clusters. Uh, that are located in the federal territory of Kuala Lumpur and Putrajaya. The sample size was calculated in order to be able to uh, calculate or to see a reduction of about 30% in the incidence of dengue. The trial will cover four intervention cycle for a period of two years and will involve a lot of uh, field workers, almost more than 50%. Next, please. This slide show you the uh, flow chart of our uh, project. Of a total of 895 uh, clusters that have been assessed for eligibility, we finally randomized 300 clusters into the intervention and control arm in a one-to-one -one ratio. Of course, the control arm will receive routine vector control programs that are routinely in place uh, in Malaysia, while the intervention area will receive in addition uh, targeted outdoor residual spraying, auto dissemination devices, and community engagement. Epidemiological monitoring will be carried out in all 300 clusters by capturing the number of dengue cases thanks to e dengue surveillance system. Automological monitoring is planned to be done in 12 clusters in each arm. Next, please. So here you can see our expectation from this trial. First of all, we expect a significant reduction in dengue incidence in intervention area and we think that uh, by involving uh, the uh, community with us, this will further enhance the vector control efficacy to ensure decrease in the incidence of dengue. We hope that this trial will allow us to have a better understanding of integrated vector control management in the control of Aedes borne disease and maybe it will help shift the policy agenda from treatment to prevention, thus saving public funding. Of course, the results could be used in other locations with similar ecology or adapted to other Aedes bone disease with same vector and process of transmission. The last uh, slide, please. 
Next one. Yeah. So just to give you uh, some summary about what is ongoing, since February this year, we had 131 localities that gave already their consent to participate in the intervention area. 63 clusters had already their first uh, intervention cycle and 19 had the second one. Of course, monthly collection of ontomological data and epidemiological data is ongoing. Next, please. With this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mitra, for the overview of the project. Next, we have Dr. Husna, who will give us a little bit more detail about the project. Hi, Dr. Husna. Hi. Hi, Sepia. Take it away. How are you? The floor is yours. Thank you. Good. All right. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. This, uh, I think uh, Malaysia is the uh, uh, evening now. So, good day, everyone. So, um, I just want to, we'll continue whatever the uh the the dr mitra has explained so basically i'm the in charge of in the operational and field activities so uh basically as i mentioned as dr mitra's mentioned in her slides uh we have a three main component which is the community engagement we have the vector control activities and also we have the uh, dengue case reported but uh in the field actually there is a four important things that we have to um uh, take care of. So the first important parts in the vector control activities is the community engagement. So for the time being, as mentioned, um, we have the consent, okay, but uh, in the field, we need to know what the type of building, number of blocks and the number of floors. This is to help us to make an arrangement and then do this, the, the uh, 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 activity schedule and then uh, we also have a very close contact with the head of commu community but uh, out of 140 about two percent is uh, where we see that there is no um, so-called uh, active community so this one is actually one of the challenge in this this, this this study so the second one is the vector control activities we conducting a targeted outdoor residual spray so why we call it targeted because so we are focusing more on um, the uh, semi semi indoors uh, or uh, what we call that as a um, covered area so basically in the corridor so we think that where the mosquito like to rest and hide and uh, the second one is uh, setting up the auto dissemination device based on our study in uh, targeted outdoor residual spray toss we find out that um, the method alone is actually managed to control the mosquitoes and uh, manage to kill the infected mosquitoes but it cannot sustain the populations uh, the mosquito population so we need another uh, help from the ADD to, main, to make sure that the mosquito populations in that particular is sustained so that there is no um, uh, not enough mosquito to uh, transmit the virus so the third one is um, because of we have the vector control activities so we need to see what is the entomological profile so based on this one we are collecting the data on the mosquito populations their densities the species the ratios the resistance status of this area and then the last one is uh, we collect the data dengue cases from the e-dengue so we try to see is there any reductions in the dengue cases reported once we already have these kinds of uh, uh, vector control activities in the study area. Next slides, please. Okay, um, well, because of uh, community engagement is one of the important um, pillars in this study. So we need to have an experts for this one. So EDEM, uh, consortium, um, uh, once somebody that knows how to handle the, the, the community. So we have uh, Puan Habsa Dusa. She is our um, uh, our, our officers and then retired last uh, December last year. So uh, because of her 25 five years experience with the Ministry of Health and the Public Engagement, so we're hiring her to become our consultant so that she can help with the com community engagement. So I think uh, we have videos. Can, can we play the videos? a community engagement consultant for this EDEM project. I have 25 years experience in community engagement when I was working in the Ministry of Health Malaysia. Today, 
I will be sharing on our strategies in conducting community engagement and the impact of it. As we know, community engagement is one of the important pillars of any community-based project. Meeting and discussion with community require a lot of patience and the art of communication because the community has a variety of backgrounds and personalities. In IDEM project, we divided our tasks into three major phases, pre-engagement, ongoing engagement, and post-engagement. For pre-engagement phase, we gave an early briefing to resident committee or joint management body in Malaysia. During the briefing session, we shared the study information and handed out information, education, and communication materials. Once they understand and approve, consent form is collected. Second, ongoing engagement. Text messages through WhatsApp, emails, brochures, posters, and banners are the key component to explain the objective of this project. Platform for any challenges and improvement feedback that the community has. Lastly, post-engagement. We are maintaining a good relationship with the community that we are working with. We collect quantitative feedback from community through market survey. To date, we have a good cooperation from the community. We gain the community support and participation on the field protocol. The community are all aware of the field work process and safety procedures. For example, the community shift the item or pad and avoid touching the wall after spraying. My team and I are excited to be part of the EDM project in combating dengue in Malaysia. We are protecting Malaysian from dengue threat by supporting and developing innovative solutions to address the global arising challenges in a new norm. Thank you. Okay, um, so uh, you, everyone already see the, the pictures that shows in the uh, Hubstars video. So this is a few pictures that we have when we do a community engagement and participation. So because of, uh, the, um, actually there is, um, we already started back the community engagement uh, since um, uh, second week of May. So what happened is we still uh, need to focus on uh, social distancing, how to wear masks and everything. But uh, again, um, this one is actually not um, the board, uh, not avoid us from do these kinds of uh, activities in the sites. Uh, next slide, next slide, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this is um, uh, vector control activities, as I mentioned earlier. So the targeted outdoor residual spray, uh, we applied the long lasting chemical insecticide at very low dose on the walls. And then this is other walls, for example. And then after we do the, we did the spray, then we have a sticker, uh, stick on the wall saying that, okay, please do not touch these uh, walls for one hour so that the, the insecticide can be uh, dried off totally. And then this is actually to avoid uh, people to, um, you know, uh, have some uh, other 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 um, uh, 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 to help us actually to help the operators actually to um, do their work uh, slightly easier. So uh, this is how how we do the work in the field. Okay, the next slides. Okay, this is how, how we set up our auto dissemination device. We choose a place where uh, it is slightly uh, not. Uh, so called can seen by by the public so slightly hidden but um for the time being it is uh the feedback from the community is quite good even though uh they see that uh there is a trap and then there is a larvae because we are using a periproxifen as uh, one of the active ingredients but they say uh, some of the feedback says that uh the number the mosquito populations is slightly reduced but um, it depends to the area actually. Uh, uh, it depends. It also depends on the um, uh, how, where is the locations of the uh, ADD. So uh, for the time being, the feedback for the ADDs is quite good. Next slide, slide please. Okay. Well, um, 
we also collect some entomological profile uh, data and then this is uh, we did it in 12 uh, localities of intervention and uh, 12 localities of control and then we did the ovary trapping and adult survey and then uh, we bring it back uh, for the identifications we also do the dual deposit bioassay to see the quality of the spray and then um, we uh, colonize the mosquito that we collect from the field for the uh, resistant status next slides okay uh, this is the last slides uh, basically in the field in the operation side um, we have lots of challenge but this is actually the most challenging part the first thing is uh, community engagement so public participation is very crucial usually we don't we won't see this kind of participations in the first cycle okay uh, usually during the second cycle once they see that there is uh, some impact on the mosquito populations or uh, reduce and then there is no case and then they will actually ask what happened and then that's, this is where they are actually participate okay um uh, another challenge is to to introduce the new methods the new tools to the public well uh, we have a different uh, level of educations for the public some of them are very good and then we have to explain more but most of the time they are actually willing to help and then willing to participate um, well we need to use lots of approach variable approach uh, to the community and then sometimes um, we uh, besides um, um, social media besides a text message besides a whatsapp message so we are in the field and then explain uh, what is actually happened and then why you have these kinds of uh, device and then what is in the, the effect to the public. So uh, the approach is different but it, actually it is quite interesting. All right and then um, the, the, the last one is to reduce the vandalism against the track that we are set up. Uh, up to now, we have a problem with the vandalism up to 18% of the track has been disturbed okay uh, and then um, in a various way uh, but again uh, not all site not all the uh, not all study site only a few but uh, this is quite high so uh, from this study we can also learn how to um, uh, how the methods on how to get the the uh, the people to participate and then to help keep the strap uh, working uh, function functioning 100% okay and then for the residual spray for the the, the targeted residual spray the most important things is spraying techniques training the spray men and operators is very crucial so we have the qc uh, in this uh, field every day to make sure that they do the right things and then we have a videos and then we keep on uh, learning with the contractors with the local contractors with the spray men on how to do the best how to improve our uh, spraying methods and then uh, the way we are doing it so uh, this is actually a two-way communication between um, uh, my team and also the um, contractors the, the spray men on uh, do the the right technique uh, spraying techniques okay um, well when we are talking about the training of course this quality of the spray is very crucial so we have the continuous uh, training continuous um, education uh, to the uh, operators so that we can have a very good uh, quality of spray um, okay for the planning actually uh, we plan in a different way and then suddenly we have a COVID-19 in so what happened is um, uh, it slow down, slow, slowing down a little bit, but uh, we are we are actually um, try to keep up. So uh, for the time being, I think it is not a problem. Only in terms of planning. So uh, well, this one is actually when we are doing a spray, we we have like uh, one team in the sites of uh, thirty people. So to keep them. Uh, fulfill the social distancing is actually ch a challenge but we managed to do it with a lots of uh, um, um, uh, explaining and then make them understand that this is a very uh, crucial I think that's it thank you thank you Dr. Husna for the presentation and also Dr. Rose and Dr. Mitra for all the presentations so now we move to our question and answer session and let's bring up the speakers to the screen and have a look at all the questions we have received so far. 
Right, so a uh, question for Dr. Mitra. It is great to see the collaboration between the private and public sector on finding ways to solve global challenges like dengue and other mosquito-borne diseases. How do I apply to join the IDEM initiative? Okay, um, thank you. So, I mean, yes, I think that, you know, running this kind of project is uh, really possible if we have multidisciplinary uh, uh, participation from everywhere and uh, uh, of course you can apply uh, the consortium is still open for more uh, partner to be involved um, you can write us uh, an email uh, saying what is your expertise what you can bring more and of course this can be discussed uh, among the steering committee members and uh, after approval yes we can maybe uh, discuss about uh, new partners okay thank you our next question we have is for dr husna based on the project's objective what will be the impact of idem in your estimation to the current dengue control measures in the region uh for this one, for these questions, okay, um, the methods that I introduced, the uh, uh, targeted residual spray and also auto dissemination uh, device is actually not just limited to the dengue. It can be any vector bond or arthropod bond diseases. So, for example, the uh, TOS is actually, we are taking it from the indoor residual spray, but we put it as an outdoor residual spray because of, we sprayed it outside of the units compared to the malaria we have it indoor so and then because of dengue is an urban um, urban diseases so we cannot enter the house most of the people are busy busy and then they they go for the work very early and then coming back late so um, well this is why we have that uh, targeted residual spray and then this is also uh, help us to um, uh, give us give give our people more methods to work with so you do you just don't have to rely on only fogging or labicidings now you have the residual spray if you think that this residual spray is uh can be done can be used in your area so you just can use it so you have various methods to play around with for the vector control activities okay question for dr rose from the perspective of aedes born diseases how would you compare vector control measures with potential vaccination in the future? Uh, well, um, the main objective um, uh, either vector control measure or vaccination measures in the context of dengue transmissions uh, is to prevent the transmissions of dengue virus um, or to stop the virus transmissions either through mosquito, through the vector or through humans. Therefore, for us to have an effective vector control measure, we must ensure that the technique used uh, in the vector control is following the standard operation procedures. And the chemical use is well controlled and monitored to prevent resistance. And uh, we need to train also our ground staff regularly uh, if they are using the technique or the chemical. Whereas uh, for us to have an effective vaccine to prevent the transmission in the community, the vaccine must have good efficacy to all serotypes, either DEN1, DEN2, DEN3, and DEN4, especially in the context of Malaysia, because we have all these four serotypes in, in our countries. Until we, uh, until we get a, a vaccine that will be effective, effective or uh, to 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 all serotypes uh, vector control measure is still needed in the to prevent transmissions uh, beside that i think vector vector control measures helps to reduce uh, mosquito populations which is a nuisance to the humans so i think that is my opinion okay thank you um dr who's now question for you um how do you ensure or control the quality of the targeted outdoor residual spray intervention measures in field operations? Okay, uh, for this one, um, we have, uh, okay, one day 
we will have a minimum of three localities being sprayed. So we have we allocate two of our staff uh, to be there and then observe every activities of this, this spray man and then they will need to take um, videos or pictures of spray and then this person are in charge of make sure making sure make sure that the operators is following the SOP on the spray so uh, this is how we do we do the qualities and then after that uh, we have the we choose randomly the uh, sites for the WHO World Deposit by USA to see the quality of the spray. So this is how we we, we, we do the, 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 the quality check for the targeted residual spray. Okay, All right. Um, Dr. Mitra, what are some of the measurements of success for the IDEM project? Okay, smart question. Um, we have uh, two measurements to see the success of the IDEM. Uh, of course, the first one is to see the extent of a reduction in dengue incidence in the intervention area. But, you know, even, even if a vector control is uh, enough, efficient, but is uh, too costly, it cannot be sustainable. So this is why we have our second measurement measure, which is economic evaluation. So cost effectiveness to, uh, of, the, of the intervention to see uh, what we gain in terms of budget compared to the currently method in place. I think uh, if I remember well, the last estimation I had from published paper was more than 1,600 uh, US dollar for dengue cases in Malaysia. So we are hoping that after this economic evaluation, we can say that the intervention is really cost effective. Okay. Um, Dr. Husna, will the research address resistance in the mosquito population? Before or after? <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, uh, yes. Actually, um, we collect some. Uh, we collect our, our mosquito before we we did the intervention, and then um, uh, before we did the the EDEM, we have one pilot study in JB. So uh, we collect the data before, and we collect after uh, the, the the the. Sorry, we collect the samples before and then after uh, six months after the intervention. What is surprising is uh, the baseline shows that actually. And the mosquito population in the area is resistance to um, two classes of the insecticides. And then uh, we incorporate uh, targeted outdoor residual spray and the auto dissemination trap for uh, eight months. And then what happened is after six months, we collect the samples back and then it shows that the mosquito shows reductions in the resistance. So uh, this is quite interesting because of I never expected that. Okay, I'm I'm uh, personally I'm quite worried. But when I saw that these kinds of data, it shows that um, uh, based on my hypothesis, it says that probably it helps uh, because of we use less insecticides. Okay, um, when we have uh, these two uh, control um, vector control activities in that particular locality, we can see that there is a reduction in the dengue cases. So we use less insecticide. So most probably this is um, affect the mosquito populations on the resistant part. So uh, we saw that in, in our pilot study. So I would say that for the EDEM also we'll have, we'll have the same thing. Uh, we will see that reductions in the resistance. But um, uh, it's too early to say anything, but uh, yeah, when, once we get the data, then we can share. Okay, that's good. Dr. Rose, question for you. Um, is the data collected by eDengue limited to only symptomatic patients? Do you have any idea about the rates of underestimation by the system due to challenges in identifying all dengue cases? Uh, yes, of course, um, in our surveillance systems, I think not only in Malaysia, or, um, this, the surveillance system usually only capture uh, patients with uh, symptoms. And then uh, usually if they have symptoms, uh, we have in Ministry of Health Malaysia, we have the policy that all patients with symptoms, fever and with other two other symptoms, for example, headache or lethargic, uh, the the doctors will have to perform the combo rapid test kit test which in the public 
in the in the government hospitals and clinic it is provided by the ministry of health uh, uh, itself it means this uh, test is provided to all the patient with the suspected dengue um, and for you for i think not only in malaysia i mean for all other countries for you to capture the asymptomatic patients you need to uh, to do a population study uh, and population study is very costly because you need a large sample uh, for you to get the prevalence of uh, dengue in the asymptomatic patients uh, but i think what is important is to to capture as much as possible patient with symptoms because these are the patients that have the potential to transmit the virus because the virus load means that if they have symptom the virus load is very high in their body and if the mosquito bites them uh, this is where the the risk of transmission of virus are very high compared to the asymptomatic uh, patients so i think we have to focus on on what is more important in controlling dengue uh, than trying to find the asymptomatic patients uh, um, also, also on the e system, uh, Dr. Rose, the Michael from Germany asked, would you recommend the system to be used in other countries too, such as the Middle East? And if yes, um, success of control depends on what conditions. Well, uh, surveillance systems, uh, yes, I, I, because this e dengue actually is a very comprehensive system. It, it includes the um the information about the cases about the patients about his test uh, serology test about the control activity about the edge survey done in in the patient residence or in the where the source of infection occur about health education activity and also we monitor the effectiveness of the control activity that is done uh, within 24 hours uh, once the case is reported. So it's a very comprehensive, I think more than 300 variables are included in this Edengi. I do recommend um, other countries to have a digital surveillance system because this is a real-time web-based surveillance system. For example, if the district put the data from their districts, which is like thousand miles from, from Ministry of Health, you can see the information immediately. Within a minute, you can see the information, but uh, provided you must have uh, internet access in, in that area. So, yeah. uh, uh, and, uh, I think um, the control measure depends, uh, as you all know that dengue is influenced by multiple factors, not only vector control, not only by, uh, uh, it's also uh, influenced by climate, by vectors, by the human uh, human movements by the environmental condition. For example, if this, the environment is dirty, a lot of uh, edges breedings, then it is very difficult for it to control. So for you to control dengue, you have to control all these factors as much as possible. Okay. Right, thank you. Um, we have a question from Professor Prakash from Nepal. Hello. Thanks, thanks for joining us today. Um, Professor Prakash asked, could we have similar collaboration implement implementation research so that the government could, could get ultimate evidence for effective control of dengue in Nepal for this and the coming years? So, so maybe Mitra, you could take this question? Sure. sure. Uh, yes, of course. I mean, we, we are really hoping that, that from a global, you know, the, uh, Currently, there is a lot of gap knowledge about really the impact of vector control activities, not on the density of Aedes population, but on dengue or other Aedes borne diseases, on the incidence, on the burden of disease. So yes, we, we from a global perspective, we really hope that our model will be used in other countries with probably even other vector control tools in order to fill these gaps. And uh, for that, we already started some discussion with uh, Latin America. It's, it is really at the initial, really initial uh, part, but we are hoping to go further and to collaborate. So yes, of course, new collaboration are more than welcome. Okay. 
So we'll we'll put you in touch with Professor Prakash from Nepal. Yeah. Right. Um, next question, I think maybe Dr. Husna could take this. Um, how do you know the reduction in the mosquito population is due to the auto dissemination device and not due to the container management being done by the residents of the community? Okay, um, for this one, uh, for the EDM, we are targeting uh, more on a multiple level building, which is a strata building, a high rise building. Okay, uh, at this area, the breeding is actually indoors. And then um, uh, for Kuala Lumpur populations, I mean, uh, we, have, we have a few studies. It shows that our dominant species for the high rise building is Aedes aegypti. And then, um, uh, the well, um, basically, we have a campaign like 10 minutes every weekend to clean up the area. But I think I'm not, I don't think that uh, all of our people are doing it. Okay, certain of them, maybe a little part of them who are doing it because of this is actually it depends on whether you get infected or not. Okay, um, well. We have uh, we uh, for 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 um, measuring the mosquito populations reductions. We have the ovi traps. We have a weekly ovi traps, and then this study I did it since two thousand and fourteen, and then it shows the reductions. And then at some point in one of our study sites, the reductions is actually seventy percent. So it is um uh, and then uh, it it is not just coming from the indoors or the critic breeding site it is everywhere so uh well uh 70% i think it's too much uh if um people are taking care of their things yeah so uh but with the with the helps of the ADD, we can get the reductions until 70% so this is um my uh, measurement my standards of how uh, it shows that reductions in the mosquito populations. So, um, and then it's happened for a few weeks. Oh, sorry, for a few months. And then uh, then it's coming back again once we remove the trap. So, this is how it works. So, this is the, the, the data. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Rose, I, I have a question for you. Um, you showed us in your presentation how elaborate and, and resource-driven the surveillance system in Malaysia is. What are your recommendations for um, countries that perhaps are just about to start and have limited resource in terms of you know setting up a surveillance system as elaborate as what Malaysia has? Um, I think th 20 years back, Malaysia was having a very simple surveillance system on dengue. But I think as the time goes by, we develop more and more in the surveillance systems. I think we realize that the surveillance is, surveillance is very important in the uh, control of dengue because you need to capture the real uh, the real case in it uh, timely met in a timely manner. So um, for a country who are going to start with uh, their surveillance system, they must uh, look at what are the existing system they have currently. I'm sure they have some system in their place and um, you utilize the existing system first and, and then they can expand they can expand uh, to more uh, broader and more uh, i think more sophisticated but uh, they must also um, review and do situational analysis of what are the infrastructure that they have in their country so because this is very important uh, for you to have a web-based surveillance system you need for example an internet access uh, to every corner of the country so you have to do a situational analysis and start with what you have currently okay thank you um dr mitra uh and also Dr. Husna, what is the next step for the IDEM project and what is your wish for the project in the future? Um, um, Dr. Mitra first? Yeah. Yes, maybe I can start. So to me, uh, as I told you already, that could be really great if uh, other endemic countries can use this model 
not obligatory using the same vector control programs, but other tools, of course, in order to have much more information about how, what is the best vector control to use, because we have really a lot of gap knowledge uh, in this uh, area. And uh, Dr. Husna can probably add more about maybe Malaysia or the region. Well, we seem to have a bit of technical problem. Yeah, we, we can't hear you, Dr. Husna. Can you do your mic test again, Dr. Husna? No, we can't hear you. Maybe we can <laughs> we can uh we can have the uh the question directed to you later on and we'll we'll answer that um very quickly. And um so so let's 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 move to the next section. Um so um We'd like to thank our panelists for the an extremely insightful and engaging question and answer uh, session. But before we end our session today, um, let's let's hear a few words from two other members of the IDEM consortium, namely from Dr. Jason Richardson from the IVCC, which is the Innovative Factor Control Consortium, and Professor Neil Alexander from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. IVCC has a long history of working on malaria control in Africa. And recently we've partnered with the Australian government's Indo-Pacific Center for Health Security uh, on an initiative with the goal of taking what we've learned in Africa and expanding and adapting it to fight Aedes and Anopheles uh, in the Asia Pacific region. And in a similar effort, we're uh, working with our partners here on the EDEM project to see if we can adapt our malaria vector control experience to help address the growing threat of Aedes born viruses in the Indo-Pacific. So one of the things that attracted us to this project is the chance to learn more about the potential of residual house spraying to control Aedes mosquitoes. And last year, the Pan American Health Organization published a manual on indoor residual spraying in urban Aedes control which was based on some real interesting evidence coming out of our Mexican colleagues where they do partial you know, or targeted indoor residual spraying and show real good impact against Aedes. So this study offers us a real unique opportunity to take that targeted indoor residual spraying approach and see if spraying uh, outer walls is also protective in areas where mosquitoes are more likely to rest and feed outdoors. So through this project and our Brado Indo-Pacific initiative, IBCC look, looks forward to continued work uh, with partners in the region to build the evidence base around vector control tools uh, and to help deliver much needed and effective control solutions both for Aedes and Anopheles in the region. Hello, I'm Neil Alexander and I'm a professor of medical statistics and epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, I was involved with the development of the IDEM trial in terms of the design, things like how to define the clusters uh, to be randomized between the intervention and control, uh, how big they should be, how many are necessary, and what the readout of the trial should be, what we call the endpoint. Before I was involved with quite a few trials of interventions against the Aedes mosquitoes, which are vectors of dengue and Zika. Often the results of those other trials were disappointing in terms of identifying a control measure to reduce the incidence of those diseases. A lot of those trials had entomological endpoints about the mosquito, not about the disease. So they could only provide indirect evidence about the impact. Uh, by contrast, the IDEM trial, it does have a disease endpoint based on e-dengue, which is an existing surveillance system in Malaysia. We were also able to use the same system 
to estimate the likely incidence of dengue when we were designing the trial. And that was a strength uh, compared to a lot of those other trials I, I worked on previously. And so this way with the IDEM trial, we got a realistic estimate of how big the trial needed to be. So, and although it was difficult to find a location and do all the groundwork now in Kuala Lumpur, I think the trial does have a good chance of uh, reaching its objectives and measuring the effectiveness of the control measures in terms of reducing dengue incidence. Okay. Thanks again, Jason and Neil, for the comments. And that brings us to the end of our webinar today. Thank you once again for joining us. We apologize for not being able to answer all your questions, but we promise you we will facilitate them accordingly to the respective speakers and get back to you as soon as possible. Um, if there are any other additional questions, please, please do send them to the email address you see on the screen. Until next time, take care. Thank you and stay safe. Mm -hmm.